Welcome back! Well, today we have something really unique for you. So, this is the first and the only laptop computer made in the USSR. It's called Electronica MS-1504. They produced so few of them, that perhaps only around 100 have survived to the present day, and we will take a comprehensive look at its design, hardware, software, and of course, the history of its creation. So, let's go! And don't forget that, as usual, you can find even more unique content on our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. Well, to my mind, looks pretty cool. You know, good quality plastic, rounded corners everywhere. Well, doesn't give an impression of a Soviet product. It does. The project of this laptop originally had the name PC-300, and it was designed in 1990 by the Production Association Integral, based in Minsk, in Belarus. Back then, this factory was famous for various innovative products, such as MK90 microcomputer, which we also reviewed in the past on our channel. And the same as MK90, the PC-300 was released under Electronica brand, and got the ID MS-1504. The laptop is based on a Soviet clone of the Intel ATC86 processor and could operate at speeds of 4.77 MHz in the standard mode and a 7.16 MHz in the turbo mode. It has 640 KB of RAM on board and there is no hard drive, but there are two 3.5-inch disk drives for 720 KB each. These drives were fully made because although Soviet 3.5-inch drives actually were developed, they never have seen mass production. The display is monochrome and it has a resolution of 640 to 200 pixels in a graphic mode or a standard 80 to 25 symbols in a text mode. Well, fast forward, there is an entire story about those displays and we will come to that as well, but a little bit later. As for the keyboard, well, it is pretty usual for laptops of that epoch, except it has an extra Kirillic Leo toggle button, and there is also a corresponding LED indicating which layout is active. The other LEDs here are to indicate the driving operation, the caps lock status, turbo mode status, and to also show that the battery is low. By the way, according to the user manual, the battery had to hold 6 hours if disks are used for the 10% of that time. On the back, there are a few ports, a power switch and a connector for 9V external power supply. There is also this metal cover, which hides a slot for expansion cards. We will also take a look at it, but a little bit later when we will disassemble the laptop and look inside. Well, in regards of ports, while the building display is monochrome itself, the display adapter is CGA. So, actually, you could get a color image by connecting a composite or a CGA display, and then by pressing function end or function home on the keyboard, you could switch between the LCD and the external display, and vice versa. And also here we have a RS-232 port and also a double-purpose connector that could operate either as a Centronix port or as a port for an external 5-inch floppy disk drive. To control the behavior of that port, at the left side of the laptop there is this three-position switch, and in the rightmost position it will enable both of building these drives and turn that port into the Centronix mode, so basically it would connect a printer or something else. And into other positions, it would enable only one of the building drives and the external one. And in documentation, there is a long explanation how to do that, how to assign letters, and so on. Also, as it was typical for the laptops of that epoch, it has a convenient handle to carry. And we have quite incomplete set, but originally there was also a special branded bag included. Well, I believe at this point many of you already got a feeling that this looks oddly familiar. And actually, that's right, because our Soviet laptop is nothing but a clone of Japanese Toshiba T1100+. A very popular consumer laptop was introduced in 1985. However, the Soviet counterpart is very different from inside, because all the schematics have been reworked in order to fit the domestic element base. But before we dismantle all that and take a look at the hardware, it is worth to tell a few things about the history of its creation, because it gives a few things to think about. 
So the design works involved a large number of engineers. But the main developers were a group of six. A few of them previously worked on that MK90 handheld microcomputer. At the same time, Soviets already were at least for a few years behind in what their microelectronic industry could achieve. And too bad, they were too long stuck with the mainframe-first paradigm, fueled by the industry over-centralized approach. There is a very well-known sentence by Nikolai Gorshkov. He was the deputy minister of electronic industry of the Soviet Union. So in 1980, he allegedly told this to developers of Micro 80, the first Soviet DIY computer, when they suggested to mass produce it. And the changes started around 1985, when Perestroika already forced that country to finally react to world achievements somewhat more actively. But too bad, the time was already lost and computers created at that time were actually obsolete from the very beginning. I believe you have seen our last year videos about the S1841 computer, which was introduced in 1987. So, even according to the Soviet media, that machine was like a western one from the beginning of the 80s, and like that it was with everything. So, that's why for the very first laptop they picked a successful, but actually obsolete machine as a prototype, because they were hit by the glass ceiling of their capabilities. So, it feels that this project was more a claim that we can do this, rather than creating uh, some really practical instrument. Yeah, there is a large article by the developers of PC-300 in the Electronics Industry magazine from 1990, and there they say that laptops are gradually taking a market share, and based on them you can create professional workplaces. So that's why PC-300 was created. Then, in 1991, in the popular magazine called Technology for the US, appeared this ad by the Integral that said that this laptop is an amazing gift for reporters, doctors, geologists, and other professionals who work far from civilization. But in reality, this laptop never gained any popularity because it had too high price for its capabilities, and even the reduction of the price in 1992 to approximately 550 US dollars in the equivalent didn't change anything. And that's one of the reasons why it is so exceptionally rare, because although they were manufactured until 1994, it seems that not more than a few thousand of them actually left the integral factory. Our has a number 1369, despite being produced relatively late, in 1993. And now let's take a look inside. It is very easy to open it, you just need to remove these three screws on the back and a few on the bottom. So, once screws are released, we can easily lift up the upper part, which is connected to the motherboard with the ribbon cable. And as soon as I opened it, I realized that we have a pretty big problem, because the internal power supply is obviously missing some gold-plated components. Well, expectable. So, I suggest that let's continue and then inspect it closer to determine whether it's possible to repair it. There is also no battery here, and actually I think it's even good, because uh, God knows where it was stored and it would probably leak over the years. So, next, let's remove the LED panel to access the display connector. And no, first we have to carefully pull out the keyboard. I will do all these things very slowly, because all those connectors, they, you know, look somewhat fragile. Okay, now let's remove the LED panel. And what is interesting, that turbo LED is actually missing here. I mean, it is not torn away, it was just not installed. And the thing is that this computer by default operates in a turbo mode, so I wonder if this means that you simply could not disengage the turbo mode at all. And the floppy disk drive cable is also missing, but I have to say that is not a problem at all, because in this connector a standard one will fit just perfectly. Ok, now we can remove the upper part and the display assembly, and it is also a time to disconnect the keyboard ribbon. Well, to be honest, it is somewhat stressful operation, because I heard how easy you can break one on this type of laptop. And, you know, you really do not want to know how much this device now costs as a collectible item. So, let's try carefully and slowly. 
very slowly. Okay. Well, contrary to the other parts I have seen so far, uh, this keyboard gives me a somewhat cheap impression. And, you know, I heard that many owners of those laptops manually changed the ribbon PCB to a ribbon cable, because the PCB was kind of really unreliable. And, well, I have to say it indeed doesn't look promising, especially on its edges. Okay, now let's take a look at the power supply. So, the problem is that due to the rarity of this laptop, there is no known wiring or pinouts of this power supply. And what is known, that it provides 5 volts to the motherboard using this small connector, and also a set of 9 and 15 volt lines, they come with the larger one. Well, here should be two impulse stabilizers, and here three more specialized chips, which are pretty hard to find now, because they were designed for military use. Well, maybe I will be able to find some analogs, you know. But first, let's look a bit deeper. And, you know, a big number of these wired connections give me a feeling that uh, there were way too many mistakes in this design, because this is somewhat, you know, not normal for a commercial product. But nevertheless, they released it. Well, some of those wires are actually torn away, and here we see that some more chips are missing. So, I think I will remove it completely for a further inspection, and to do this, I need to remove the metal cover of the expansion slot, because its shape prevents any further manipulations. Well, I have to say, this looks really bad. It seems to me that someone used an industrial fan here to remove the components, so likely this is really, really, really bad. You know, I'm looking at this, and it gives me a sort of philosophical question. Okay, unknown guy, you got your five dollars by selling those chips for gold, right? I'm even not touching the fact that just one of those chips, as a chip, costs, I think, at least fifteen. But you, didn't you have a feeling that you can earn much more if the device would be still intact? Eh? Finally, to access and inspect the motherboard, we need to remove this drive and battery bay, which is technically one piece of plastic secured by three screws. Just look at this beauty, you know, it's really well made. Uh, absolutely doesn't look like a Soviet-made thing. Well, to be accurate, it is no longer Soviet, but previous were exactly the same. Those inscriptions on the left say the date of assembly, but it is blank, and to the right, the date of production. And here is written it is January 1993. And interesting that all that is written actually in Russian, but with the Latin letters. I guess it's because the software they used simply didn't support Cyrillic alphabet. And notice this ISM5, which is shortened from Revision 5. This is the latest known revision of the motherboard, so it actually passed a few upgrades of its design over the time of the, this product lifetime. And the motherboard itself has the same shape as one in the Toshiba laptop, but the circuitry is totally different and is based on a Soviet element base. But what is really interesting that a lot of chips here are either rare or experimental, and many are marked in a non-standard way. For example, there is a chip marked as just DL27, and it is a floppy disk controller that should be normally marked as KR1835 VG17. Technically, it is a Soviet copy of TC8565 from Toshiba. So, this DL in its mark stands for Delegat 270, which was an internal code name of the program of the chip development at Integral Factory. The same fashion name has the processor, it is marked as DL24, and by the standards it should be marked as KR1834VM86. Well, I might be wrong, but I can't recall this very processor used in any other Soviet computer. Then there is also a chip called DPES-1, which is a controller of the serial port. It is a clone of 82C58 chip. And the letters in the code come already from another code name, the deputy program. 
Moreover, while many chips here are actually marked by the standards, they have an extra letter O before the identifier, which stands for the experimental production. For instance, there are 20 RAM chips that form a 640 kilobytes memory bank, and they are marked as OKR565RU11D, or this chip, about which there is simply no information on the internet. If you look from another side, there is this experimental chip, which is a single chip microcontroller. It provides here the keyboard functionality. So, you know, for the Soviet industry, this laptop computer itself was an experiment. But seeing this gives an insight at which scale this experiment was. Those two chips, KA1835 VG9 and VG15, are system bus multiplexers, and next to them is a CGA adapter based on VG10 controller chip and three chips that form a 16 kilobytes bank of video RAM. There is also this real timer chip, KA512 V1. And the same as a Toshiba prototype, this laptop has an onboard clock, which is very unusual for Soviet machines. But contrary to Toshiba's product, which had a separate battery for it, this one requires at least some residual charge in the main battery to run. And if it is gone, you won't be able to start a DOS version greater than 3.3. This 60-pin connector is for the expansion card. Well, it is still an open question if any variety of cards were ever produced. I didn't find any information about them except a notice from developers that this slot allows to turn the laptop into some professional workstation. And finally, let's take a look at the display. Well, dismounting this part has one trouble, because while the front panel is holding on clips, it has one hidden screw right under the brand sticker, which acts as a seal. So it is not possible to access it without applying some damage to it. And fast forward, the sticker was made on a thick transparent film, and a part of it remained on the film, so when place it back, it looks less more as before. By original plans, here had to be a Soviet-made LCD matrix called Ija G93, produced in Russian town of Saratov at the factory named Reflector. In the electronics industry magazine we mentioned before, it is possible to find a detailed article about it. That includes a lot of technical details for both display and its controlling chipset. The article also features a picture of the developers. But that display didn't have a backlit and actually was not very good quality, so to the present day only a very few survived in a less more functional condition. So, next modification of MS1504 laptop started to have foreign LCDs. And the vast majority of laptops had original Toshiba displays. But when the batch of them ended, the laptops got LCDs made by Citizen. So, those displays already had backlit, and therefore the shape of the lid was redesigned. Uh, that's exactly our case, because as you can see, it is notably thicker, and the display is somewhat smaller than the original Toshiba prototype. So, inside we have a display matrix and a regulated power supply. I wonder if this supply is Soviet or foreign? Well, the same as the LCD, the power supply was produced in Japan, but this one is by TDK. Ok, so now let's assemble it back and try to test if it is alive. So, from people who own exactly the same laptops, we learned that for the very, very basic test, it is sufficient to provide motherboard with a few voltages. It will not work properly, of course, but at least we will know if the motherboard at least somewhat functional. I also temporarily installed here a floppy disk drive ribbon cable. So, on attempt of powering it on, a caps lock LED flashes for a short time, the display starts to glow, and artifacts on it become visible. So, likely the display is not functional, but at least we can see approximately what the color of the output image had to be. So, the computer doesn't pass post, obviously, it gives two beeps, uh, which may indicate either video or memory in proper operation. And unfortunately, the commentation doesn't give any hints about this meaning. It recommends just to go to the authorized service center, which in 2023 is kind of a problem. Well, however, at least twice it tried to access the floppy drive we selected with this switch. 
So that's what we can do now, but of course we will try to find a way to obtain a proper power supply, and if so, there will be a continuation. But the story doesn't end here. Our cat could find an image of the original software disk with test and demo instruments for this laptop computer, which perfectly run on our Infort 8386 we recently restored. So let's look at the demo app. There is a long readme file that says that the app is intended for the operator that demonstrates the graphic capabilities of MS1504 laptop. The file obviously meant to be printed, because it contains this standard information table for every page, including even last names of actual authors of the document. You know, I love such details. Ok, so here we have an animated welcome screen that says graphics on PC 300. Then appears this proud message that developer of the hardware is Scientific Production Association Integral, Minsk, Belarus 1990. So the next we have this menu, which has many options. The first is using of Windows. The window says example of the text editing, and the text in it says it is a demonstration of use of Windows and graphic mode on PC 300. Every window defines a part of the screen. All following operations will be performed on a particular window. Parts of the diagrams that won't fit will, will not be pictured. Scaling is also supported. Press Enter to continue. And if I press Enter, there appears a new window titled Example of Graphics. Ok, if I press Enter, there appears a message that you can move windows, overlap them partly or completely, and so on. And the quantity of windows is limited only by the memory, which can handle around 200 of them. By the way, in regards of windows, but here I mean operation shell, not this thing, I know it is possible to start Windows version 1 on original Toshiba laptop, and I wonder if it is possible on this one. If you'll fix it, we surely will try. Ok, so next is a demonstration of graphic shapes. Well, here everything is simple. Points, lines, squares, ellipses, segments, rectangles. Oh my eyes! The next is a demonstration of pie charts. And here is a detail that grabbed my attention. Because we get here a table of sales in 1985, but values are in millions of US dollars. And that is actually really funny, because for possession of foreign currency, a person could get a real term in jail in the USSR. And for calculations of foreign currency, uh, uh, say in some enterprise, a concept of foreign currency equivalent ruble was used, so you never would have it in dollars. In other words, the picture it is absolutely impossible situation. And you know, it's good it was 1990, because five years before, the creators of this would have a chance to talk with, you know, very polite, but cold-eyed people, if you understand what I mean. No matter that this likely is just translated Toshiba made presentation. The next is a polynome interpolation. Well, that looks quite beautiful. The next test displays the ways how a mathematical function can be presented. We have a simple function in minus p plus p coordinated system. Next are two examples of function with axes. Next is the function with points and the circles. And then two functions combined with axes. Well, beautiful, beautiful. The next test is building shapes in 2D space, but somehow it doesn't work. And the same happens with the next test that's supposed to draw some three-dimensional graphics. But the last one, which says dynamical process demonstration, works pretty well, and it displays us a uh, sort of simple algorithm in action. Uh, this blinking is really hard for my eyes. So that was the demo app, but there is also this test package, and it also contains a document that explains that it was intended for the engineer of the final production control, so it was not a customer thing. And there is a special application for that, that uses the internal factory name, PC300. So past this welcome screen is a menu which gives you a choice to test graphic adapter, a keyboard, disk drives, parallel interface for a printer, serial interface, and real timer. 
So the graphics adapter test has a few options. An LCD screen test will display you combinations of lines of various density, which change on a key press. Uh, well, I noticed that, that the program reacts somewhat slow, and uh, it's very hard to look at this on a big screen, you know. Probably on LCD it was much better. Then the RGB display test uh, will give you a palette of the colors supported. Then two other options are test of video RAM and a character generator RAM. And those tests will just give you a message of success on completion. Nothing special. The keyboard test is really straightforward. You just press a button and it should be marked on the screen. It says also to test function button, use function plus F1. However, when I pressed right shift, I went to the loop and needed to reboot the computer. The floppy drive test starts with the prompt of the drive selection and whether you want to test the external disk drive as well and whether the test should be short or long. And then it starts and despite I selected a shorter test, it took a really long time to complete. Well, I find it a bit funny that the floppy disk pictured here is actually 5.25 inch, while the computer uses 3.5 inch disks, and 5 inch could be only external. But I wonder how many users actually have it. So in the end, it gives a message of the end of the test on the screen. That's all. As for the printer test, we don't have a printer connected here at the moment, so it won't start. A bit more you can get at the serial interface test, uh, but to complete it you need to solder and connect a special test connector to the port. Without that connector attached, the test just gives a message, could not set up a flag, receiver buffer full. And finally, there is also a test of real timer that just gives a message that all is good with it. Well, I expected that the clock would have a real value on the screen, but it appeared to be just an illustrative image. So that's it. Our next step will be to figure out the schematics of the damage at power supply, and if you succeed with that, we surely will have a continuation. And in the meanwhile, don't forget to subscribe, because something really epic is coming. And also check our Patreon page, because there is pretty much interesting. So that's it. See you next time.